Happy Sabbath, Church. Um, it's, it, it's really a joy to be here with you today. Um, I, I, I have to say, first of all, um, you, your pastor um, couldn't, well, he, he, he wouldn't let me be here without him being here as well. Because during the week um, at the conference, our office is in the same office. So we share an office at the conference, and today, uh, you know, as he allowed me to preach here in Stoke Newington, uh, he thought that we have to be together as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to, to be here with you. Um, I, I'm, I'm also glad that um, the weather is not as yesterday, because then everybody would have been fanning and thinking, well, when can we get out of this room with so many people? Um, but, 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 but now I, I, I'm trusting that you can pay attention. Um, you know, the heat sometimes get to us. And, and I remember one time I, I went to a church uh, somewhere abroad, and there were only about 39 or 40 degrees outside. And, um, and, 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 and inside, everybody was with short sleeve and uh, just in their trousers, and they were looking at me, and I said, look, can I at least take my jacket off? And they said, no, you're the preacher. Um, uh, needless to say that I, I, I noticed that after a while, they weren't paying attention anymore because everyone was still hot as they were. Um, and I kept drinking water because that's, yeah, that's how it was. Uh, but today, I trust that all the elements are coming together so that by God's grace, the message that I'm going to bring to you will, 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 will sink in and the Holy Spirit will have something to work with. Because the truth is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of the uh, popular uh, conference directors. Um, because when we think about stewardship, uh, we think about, uh, well, money, we're, we'll come to that. Um, we think about responsibility. And, and, you know, we don't really like to be reminded that we have to be responsible. So uh, when I go around and when I talk to people, uh, and I, oh, well, you know, stewardship, are, are you going to talk to us about money? And I said, well, it's not only about money. I'm going to challenge you to a lot more than that. So then I've only been in the office for uh, two months. Um, uh, that, 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 that's when, when I was called to come and serve. Um, and I have to tell you, it, it's not one of those departments that are invited a lot to go to other churches. Yeah. Pastor Quadjo with Sabbath School, he can come and talk about how nice Sabbath School is. Um, uh, personal ministries goes everywhere, you know, reminding people, you know, we have to be active and involved. Um, but stewardship is, is something else. And that's because if we were really honest with ourselves, we've left the topic of stewardship somewhere in the background um, because it's uncomfortable. And I'll tell you, um, again, Pastor Quadjo, sorry, but there would be no Sabbath school unless we were good stewards. Yeah? There would be no personal ministries unless we were good stewards. Because stewardship, just in a short tagline, is managing God's blessings, God's way, for God's glory. We've been blessed with the word of God, haven't we? Yeah, we've been blessed with truth. We've been blessed with a revelation. We've been blessed with a calling from God to follow him and be part of his church. All these things are blessings that we've been called to be good stewards over. So when we get our Sabbath school quarterly and our lesson from the scriptures, that's a blessing for us. And the reason we sometimes miss Sabbath school and we don't study our lesson, our quarterly, is because we are not managing that blessing well. Sometimes when our relationships between us in church are not the way they should be, well, let me tell you something. It's because we are bad stewards. Because we've been blessed with a church to worship in and we've been blessed with a church family. And when the family doesn't get along well, or when there is tension, or when the family doesn't pull in the same direction, it's because we have not been good stewards of the blessing of the relationship that we're supposed to have with one another. Even when the building is crumbling, do you know why the building is crumbling? 
because we've been blessed with a building in which we can gather and we're not managing that blessing well. I've been to churches where uh, as soon as you walk in, you, you wonder what's, what kind of, ble- what kind of uh, building is this? I, I, I went to churches where I said, well, do you have any activities, um, certain activities that are more creative evangelism and so on? Well, no, we don't really do that because the building has been dedicated to the Lord. And I'm looking with, with my big eyes and I'm saying, have you really? Because when you dedicate something to the Lord, what do you do with it? You look after it. You cannot walk into a crumbling building and say, well, this building has been dedicated to the Lord because it means that you've done a poor job of managing that dedication and that blessing. And that's why I'm saying stewardship is a lot more than just money. I'm going to come to the money issue in a moment. But today I want to challenge you to think differently about your life, every single aspect of your life. Because stewardship is about managing God's blessings, all of them, God's way. Because you might receive a blessing and you might think, well, I I, I know how I'm going to manage this blessing. You might get a nice car and think, well, uh, you know what, it's it's, it's quite a powerful car, so um, I'm going to get on the motorway and even if it says 70 miles an hour, I'm going to do 90 because there's no speed camera here. You, re- you receive the blessing, but it doesn't mean you're using it in the right way, yeah? <laughs> Stewardship is about managing God's blessings, God's way, but also for God's glory. Because everything that we are and everything that we do is supposed to bring honor and glory to God. And when our purpose is to bring honor and glory to God, you know what will happen. Lives will be changed and this world would be changed because we're doing it all for God as he would do it. So stewardship is about managing God's blessings, God's way, for God's glory. So that's why my... Uh, my motto, my desire for the next three years or uh, maybe the next few months, I, I, I don't know how long I will be in, in, in this office, uh, is this. I want to challenge people to live better, to love better, and to serve better. Amen. Because when we are good stewards, living will become a joy. Amen. We will learn to live in a way that is really healthy and happy and conducive to good relationships and and everything that is good. Loving better is about loving God and loving one another better. And serving better, well, it's about remembering that it's not only about us and how good we are and how good our life is, but it's about how do we serve God and those around us in the name of the Lord. I was reading a story a few weeks ago. How many of you have heard of John Pounds? You don't know John Pounds from Portsmouth? No? no? <laughs> don't worry. You probably don't know him because he lived in early 1800s. Oh. John Pounds was a cobbler in the 1800s. And he had a small workshop where he would do what do cobblers do? Shoes. He would repair shoes for people and he would uh, do that. That was his trade. Uh, John was not a very rich man. Um, he was not a man who went to school for a long time. But you know what? He had uh, a few literacy skills. He had a great passion for uh, his community uh, and he had a love for people. So one day, as he was walking through his community in Portsmouth, um, he realized that the children who were living in that community had no idea how to read or write. And, and, and John decided that, you know what, I don't have a lot to offer, but what I do have to offer, I will try and offer it to these children. So he invited children from the community to come to his workshop to learn how to read and write. There was not a lot of space. So 
He put letters and, and numbers uh, uh, hanging everywhere uh, in his workshop. Um, the, the children who could not afford any paper, um, he would uh, teach them how to write in sand. He did his best to teach the children in his community how to do better in life. At one point, there were about 40 children who were studying in John Pounds' workshop regularly. His story spread all over the country and uh, all sorts of other small uh, mini schools were born from what he did. And today, the educational system that we all know and our children are a part of was born from what John Pounds did in the early 1800s in Portsmouth. This man never got rich. He never made any money out of, this, out of this service that he was offering to those children. But you know what? He thought, if I have a small gift, if I was blessed with something, I need to share it with those around me. Yeah. And that's why I was, I was thinking when I read this story, it, it inspired me to, to think, well, what resources, big or small, do I have that I can offer in order to help my community, those around us, to live a little bit better? How have I used my resources, my blessings, my time, my talents, my relationships to make the world around me a little bit better? Because this is what stewardship is about. Stewardship is not about having a lot and, and sparing a little. Stewardship is about using the little you have to make a difference. And if we don't do that, we're not good stewards. Joseph was a good man uh, and a good example uh, that can help us to see what holistic stewardship looks like. Uh, Joseph, uh, uh, he, he, he came from a, very, from a position of privilege. But from that position of privilege, he ended up in a pit. He was almost killed by his brothers. And then from being killed by his brothers, he actually ended up in a worse position. Because let me tell you, I don't know how you see it, but it's worse to be sold as a slave than to lose your life. Because at least if they would have left him there to die, that would have been it. But he was sold to a different foreign nation that had none of the principles and values that Joseph was brought up with. And he was supposed to be there and do whatever he was told. And well, despite his harsh circumstances, Joseph decided to remain faithful to God and to use diligently his time, his uh, talents, and his treasures. Because as a slave in Potiphar's house, Joseph managed the household with integrity and skill, and he earned his master's trust. Joseph could have said, could have said at any point, you know what, the God that my father brought me up to believe in did not help me too much. And I'm in this position. But when his dad brought him up to believe that God wants him to have integrity and good principles... Joseph kept that. The fact that he earned his master trust took him to a good position. But unfortunately, that came with another trial. Because while he was a slave in Potiphar's house, uh, he is falsely accused and imprisoned. But you know what Joseph did when he got to prison? What did Joseph do? Joseph used his gift of interpreting dreams to help the other prisoners in there. Again, Joseph had the opportunity to say, God, I don't care about the gift you have given to me because I'm in prison and I'm so upset and I'm depressed and I've got so many worries. And, and God, look, don't bother me with this gift. But Joseph said, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of where I am right now or how I feel right now, my gift has to be put to good use. 
So he started interpreting dreams for the other prisoners, which led him eventually to be the second man in command in Egypt. And when he got to be in that position, uh, after interpreting dreams and using that gift, well, Joseph continued to use the gifts that God gave him, and he was a good manager, not only for a small household, not only for a small church, not even for a big church, but for a whole country that was able to save enough grains and to store enough food to, to serve not only the people in Egypt, but for other nations to come as well. Because the moment God has blessed you with a gift, no matter how small, it's not about how you feel in that moment. It's not about your circumstances in that moment. It's about how you put your gift to good use, regardless of what is happening with you. Because we haven't been called to live for ourselves. We've been called to live for God. We've been called to use His blessings, His way, for His glory. So today we will look at a couple of points that have to do with, with stewardship. And we're going to reflect on the questions, how are you using the gifts that God has given to you? Are you using your time wisely? Are you using your talents to be a blessing for others? Are you a faithful steward of your financial resources? What are the areas of my life where improvements can take place and I can start right now? And let's start with time. We had our scripture readings taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. One of the most precious resources that God has given to us is time. Yes. And Paul is warning us to be careful of how we organize our time, which is something that our life today discourages us to do. You wake up in the morning and you must catch up with the latest news and the latest uh, notifications from social media and the latest messages from WhatsApp. Many years ago, if you wanted to watch something on TV, you would turn the TV on and you had maybe three or five or ten TV channels. And if nothing was interesting, you would switch the TV off and you go off and read a book. <laughs> Today, you turn the TV on and there are, you can access hundreds of channels. And if you don't like what's on TV, guess what? There are platforms where you can watch movies and series and whatever else for as long as you want. How many still read a book? The list could go on because the list of distractions that are meant to help us to waste time is much, much greater than the list of encouragements to manage our time wisely. But we have to realize that time is a non-renewable resource. Once time passes, we can't get it back. Have you heard anyone saying in the past, or have you said, well, this is five minutes of my life that I'll never get back? Or this is an hour of my life that I'll never get back? Well, the truth is that that reality should compel us to reflect on how we spend our time every single day. I like very much um, a passage from Ellen White in Christ Object, Object Lessons, page 342, where it says, Our time belongs to God. Every moment is His, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to His glory. Of no talent He has given will He require a more strict account than of our time. You know what? You might be blessed with some money or a good job, and you mismanage the money or the job, well, guess what? You can get another job. You can get some more money. With all the resources, we have a possibility of getting a second chance. But with time, you don't get a second chance. 
once time is gone, it's gone. So the question we need to ask ourselves is whether we are using the blessing of time to, to reach the potential that God has placed within us, or if we are burying it and, and wasting it. Because it's alarmingly easy to bury our time and the most of the opportunities that God has given to us. You know, today we, we think in terms of technology and uh, uh, yesterday's <laughs> problem around the world uh, proved that, yeah, technology is not something that you can always rely on because an update can come and all of a sudden the whole world crashes. Um, but it was just Windows, so only Microsoft. So if you use Apple products, it should be better. Um, <laughs> Technology, no matter who makes that technology, is vulnerable. And, 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 but we are reliant on it. We are so reliant on it that yesterday people were panicking, not knowing how they will live their life without access to computers. <laughs> GP surgeries all over the country were not able to, to make bookings and see people because the system was down. Imagine that. Somebody needs to see their GP for an urgent matter because it's Friday. And you're told, we're sorry, but we cannot book you in because our systems are down. We are so reliant on things that are unreliable. So... Because of where we are right now, we, we confuse even our interactions uh, in the digital space with genuine interactions. But the truth is, nothing can replace pen and paper, and nothing can replace face-to-face -face interaction. One of the things I missed most during COVID was being able to shake someone's hand and give them a hug. Because that makes me feel that I'm interacting with a real person. But today, we don't have that anymore. We don't have our interactions anymore. We, we, we don't have um, an understanding of the true essence of relationships because we've replaced meaningful conversations with superficial uh, online interactions. You know, we just give a thumbs up if someone sends a message or uh, we, 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 we just um, put our hands um, together if someone needs prayer. We don't call them to pray for them anymore. We don't go around their house anymore. We just put the praying hands, which apparently I'm, I'm, I'm told that it might actually be the symbol for high five, not for, um, not for prayer. But that's another story. But we are meant to, we, we, are, we are led to believe that that is a genuine interaction. That that is a genuine way of interacting with one another, loving one another, and even loving God sometimes. Showing love for one another has taken a hit. When I joined the Seventh Adventist Church, because I was not always a Seventh Day Adventist, but I, I joined back home in Romania, and um, I remember I, I went to church on Sabbath, and at the end of the main service in the morning, uh, there were often people who would invite me over for lunch in their house. I've been in the UK for about 15 years now. I've been invited two or three times. That, that, that was before I was a pastor because <laughs> <laughs> inviting the pastor for lunch... I mean, one, one thing is that you can't gossip anymore about what happened in church and who was wearing what. Uh, but, but then the pastor might have a serious conversation with you after lunch as well. So, you know, don't invite pastor for lunch. That's, that's what I understood. But we don't spend that time together anymore. We might live across the road from one another, but we don't go to have a, a cup of herbal tea together. But if someone sends a message on a WhatsApp group, We'll give a thumbs up because, yeah, you know. We don't allocate the time for relationships anymore. And even for church, I remember in, 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 the, in the last maybe eight, nine years, 
I, I saw more church happening. I'll mention again WhatsApp. There was more church happening on WhatsApp than in church. There were more people active and sharing and talking on WhatsApp than they were in the church. Because in church, they would turn up, uh, hide somewhere in the church, and then disappear before the end of the service. And then in the afternoon, they would share something on WhatsApp. After COVID, it got even worse because people started sharing services from all over the world. You know, and you're thinking, well, are, are you still fighting for your local church or are you on a different team? The way we manage our time in 2024 is not always done in the wisest way. And Paul warns very, very clearly. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I like another part of Christ's object lessons where Ellen White writes this. There are some who think that if they give money to the cause of Christ, this is all they are required to do. The precious time in which they might do personal service for him passes unimproved. But it is the privilege and duty of all who have health and strength to render to God active service. All are to labor in winning souls to Christ. Donations of money cannot take place of this. So as stewardship director, I can come before you and talk to you about money and the importance of money. But that would be against my belief that unless a transformation happens in my life and in your life, the money that we bring are worthless. Amen. Being good stewards of our time, of our relationships. Romans 12, 6 to 8 speaks about the stewardship of talents. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. It's also Paul who reminds us that we shouldn't only be good stewards of our time, but also that if we've been given a gift, what should we do with it? Use it. Because it's so easy to leave my gift aside. Because I want to prove something. I want to be someone else other than who God called me to be and who God made me to be. So I will come and having left my, having locked my gift in the car before I enter the church, I will come in and be who I want people to see. But that's not necessarily my gift. That's not necessarily who God wants me to be today. It's who I want to be today. But the parable of the talents that we know so well says that, well, some people received five talents. Other people received two talents. Other people received one talent. And do you know who was commended and who was invited to join the feast? The one who received five and used them. And the one who received two and used them. But the one who received one and locked it and buried it somewhere deep, It's difficult for me to read the passage uh, from, from, from Matthew where the master says what will happen to the one who buried that one talent. Because it's not a nice image. We've all been blessed with at least one gift. And you know what? God didn't give you more gifts that you can manage. And God didn't give you less gifts that you can manage. Because God doesn't overestimate someone, and he doesn't underestimate someone. He gives to all the people the right gift that they need at a certain time. And you, all of you being here today, all of you being part of this church, let me tell you something. God has not uh, gifted everyone with the same gift. 
God has given you different gifts that you are to use in order to make the body of Christ here in Stoke Newington work and grow. And if you're going to bury your talent, it's very likely that someone else might not have that talent. And then this whole body stops functioning well. Use your talent in church and out of church, in the community, in your daily life. It's our responsibility to nurture and use these talents in the service of others. And by doing so, we fulfill our calling as good stewards of God's grace. We have to commit to use our gifts to build up the church, to serve our community, to bring glory to God. Because our talents, no matter how seemingly small or insignificant, are precious in God's eyes and can make a significant impact when they're used faithfully. Good stewards make a big impact. And don't compare your gifts to other people. Because some people don't want to use their gift because they feel that, well, I've seen sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, and, and, and they seem to be uh, having the same gift as I have, but I'm not as good as them. That's no reason to be discouraged or not to use your gift. But grow it. Make it stronger. And you'll see the difference it makes in your life and in the life of others as well. And lastly, Matthew 6, 19 to 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is not calling us to be poor, but to set our priorities and to get our priorities right. You see, trust treasures encompasses all the material resources that God has blessed us with, our money, our possessions, our wealth. And the first step is to recognize that everything comes from him. Everything is his blessing. And once we do that, there are three things that I want you I, I want to challenge you to think about. First of all, budgeting. Now, you might not know, but in the scriptures, there is a verse in Proverbs 27, verses 23 and 24, where we are advised, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. The book of Proverbs is encouraging us to know the state of our flocks. Because having a flock today doesn't mean you're going to have the flock tomorrow. Just having an income doesn't mean that you're going to have money tomorrow. Having money today in your bank account and a healthy balance doesn't mean that tomorrow is still going to be there. We get paid on the 25th of the month. On the 1st of the month, my wife looks at me and she says, well, it's all gone. Because <laughs> I've set all my direct debits on the 1st of the month, so I have at least five or six days to, um, to, 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 to check the bank balance and, and feel safe. But on the 1st, it's gone. Rent, bills, oh, this and that. Riches are not forever. Through budgeting, we know what comes in and what goes out, and, and, and we are able to have a, a better picture of what we can afford. We can have a better picture of where we are right now and where we want to be. Because now I come to the second point, and that is uh, saving and investing. Look, I'm, 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 I'm not saying that uh, Jesus is not coming soon. I pray that Jesus will come soon. But you know what? Generation after generation have been praying for that and have been expecting Jesus' coming for the last 2,000 years. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, Jesus is not coming, but it's not the time for him to come. So I have to prepare as if he might come in my lifetime, but what if he doesn't? 
It was only this week Pastor Quadra was sharing with me about a pastor. And I, I, I know about pastors as well uh, who, who, who have been working diligently all their life. And upon their retirement, they, they realized, oh, I have nowhere to live. There are many people who don't think about, well, what's going to happen next? And going back to the story of Joseph, I learned from Joseph that in the good years, you have to prepare for the bad years. When there are years of prosperity, you prepare for the years when there will be drought. But that can only happen when I know what my current state is, what my current status is. And that can only happen when I make a plan in the time of prosperity for the time when there will be drought. I'm looking at my life, and I'm sure many of you can look back and, and, and think about this as well and, and, and realize it's a reality for you. Maybe if I made better decisions 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have some of the concerns that I have today. It's not that God is not blessing me today. And it's not that God is not blessing us today. But often when God blesses us and we are not good stewards over the blessing of God, we come later in a few years' time and complain, oh, this is not enough, this is not good, this is, uh, nothing is working well in my life. But God blessed you already. And you didn't manage it properly. There's no point in praying for God to give you more blessings now if you can't manage them properly. Some people do receive that one talent, that one blessing, and they pray to God and they, they're, they're angry with God because, God, I wanted five. And if God would speak to that person, God would say, well, I gave you five a while ago. And you lost all of it. So let's start small. <laughs> let's this time round start from a different place. If we were good stewards at every moment of our life with all the blessings that God is giving us, we wouldn't have some of the worries that we have today. Amen. Budgeting, saving and investing. And now it comes to giving. Sometimes we struggle to give because we think, well... I don't have enough to give. But can you see that if I did my part well when it comes to the budget and what comes in and what goes out, and if I prepared for the times that were when, 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 when the sea is angry, maybe I wouldn't worry about God, I'm going to give you whatever is left because I've got other commitments right now. We have to give to God from all our heart. The Bible encourages us to, to give and to be happy when we give. But when we haven't done things right prior to giving, we won't be happy. There is an order for everything in our life, and, and God is a God of order. And that's why He is trying to remind us all the time to live right. To live better, to love better, and to serve better. We wouldn't be grumbling as much as we did if we were able to see what God has blessed us with. And if we were open to managing that blessing, God's way, for his glory. We cannot forget other areas of our life that we are called to be stewards over. We are called to be stewards over the God's creation. Um, in this digital age, stewardship extends to how we manage our online presence and our digital resources and, and, and our bodies, um, temples of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, how will we respond to the divine trust? Will we bury our talents? squander our time and hoard our treasures? Or will we rise to the challenge, faithfully managing all that God has given to us to advance his kingdom and bless others? I'm going back to the story of John Pound. 
John was a man who started something that grew into a movement in his days and set the foundation for an educational system for many generations after that. He was not a Seventh-day Adventist because when he did what he did, there were no Seventh-day Adventists around. I've met other people who are not Christians who said, well, you know what, I cannot just waste my time. I cannot just waste my resources. I cannot just waste what I'm good at. I need to put them to good use. And they change a little or a lot in the environment where they live. How much of an impact could we make as Seventh-day Adventist Christians if we were good stewards over all the blessings that God has given to us? If we were more mindful of our relationships? If we were more mindful of how we spend our time? If we were more mindful about how we live, how we love, and how we serve? May God help us all to reflect on that and do things better. May God help us to live better, to love better, and to serve better. God bless you. Amen.